All right. So hi, everybody. I'm Paula Marin Zapata from the Machine Learning Research Group at Berlin, uh, of Bayer at Berlin. And I will follow on Niran's presentation, giving you some updates uh, uh, about the JumpCP consortium, but this time focusing on the computational aspects. Uh, just a second, I want to use my laser pointer. Yes. So uh, a very quick recap. So uh, here I'm presenting the slide that Niran already showed you. Uh, we show the profiling workshop uh, workflow, which we're using in the consortium. So uh, very quickly, we start with cells treated with different perturbations. We use the cell painting essay to image uh, uh, the treated cells, and then we extract morphological profiles, which are then used for further uh, downstream analysis. And in the consortium, uh, we promise to screen 140,000 uh, chemical and genetic perturbations. We promise to publish the images and also to make public the profiles, both using cell profiler and deep learning approaches. And in this first year of the consortium, before the data was being produced, then regarding the computational aspects, we focus on developing methods for image quality control and for feature extraction. And starting with the image quality control, we thought that this consortium offer a perfect setup to collect a <clears throat> a uh, very diverse set of images with quality control problems and uh, hopefully use this data set to train a, a very generalizable deep learning model to classify image QC. So we ask uh, all the partners to provide uh, images for um, the, an empty, a debris and a blurry class. And here on the right, you can see uh, the data set that we collected. So we had, of course, different microscopes, but also a lot of different resolutions. And uh, since the full data set was very unbalanced, we also uh, uh, took a subsample of this data set, taking care uh, to have a better uh, balance of classes in the train and validation set, and also including images from all resolutions. And uh, here are the results. So uh, for this uh, model, we tested uh, three different architectures or three different models. Mm, the first one was a random forest trained on cell, uh, cell profiler features. And for this, we use the cell profiler analyst software. And uh, the software does not only provide a tool to train these classifiers, but also provides a tool to uh, correct the mistakes of the classifiers and retrain and improve the models. So it's a very accurate uh, method, but it also requires a lot of human input. And uh, one of the disadvantages is, of course, and that it also needs to re be retrained uh, for each batch. And uh, besides that, we also tested the typical uh, pre-trained uh, ImageNet architectures. For this case, we chose ResNet 50 where we either retrain all the layers of the network or just the classifier, and we tested two image uh, resolutions, so two image resampling si uh, sizes. And finally, um, we tried an architecture which was uh, a particularly uh, designed, so a previously published architecture, which is particularly designed for image quality control classification. And uh, this architecture is based on uh, transformers, and because of the self-attention mechanism that these uh, transformers have, so visual transformers, uh, uh, the architecture gives different weights to different locations in the image, which is particularly useful for us, for example, when we have a debris, a debris class, which is very localized in only specific regions of the image. And uh, besides that, it's also a very good architecture because it accepts images from different resolutions. So it, it, it means that we don't need to resize the image because resizing can also affect the perception of quality of the images. And uh, to be able to compare it with the pre-trained uh, architectures, we also use our ResNet backbone for that. And uh, here you can see the results on our uh, uh, validation set where we see that the, that the transformer-based architecture performs much better than the pre-trained ImageNet architectures. And it also has a very similar accuracy, accuracy to uh, the cell profiler baseline that requires a lot of human input. Um, however, if we uh, look at the confusion matrix uh, of the transformer architecture and we highlight the highest of diagonal values, so which means the highest misclassified um, uh, classes, we see that they always Im involve the debris class. So either debris that was classified as good or blurry or good images were, which were classified as debris. And, and this was kind of expected because the debris class is uh, very diverse and it was also the most difficult class to collect because it didn't appear in all the channels. And uh, therefore, we would like to also use this presentation to advertise that we're welcoming donations for fluorescent images with debris problems. And uh, of course, these models would be publicly available and it would benefit uh, the complete community. 
And if you want to contact us, uh, you can go to the consortium uh, webpage and there is a contact information on how to reach to us. Um, all right, and now moving to the feature extraction, uh, we have finished now the cell profiler pipelines and we started working on the uh, deep learning pipelines. So for the cell profiler um, pipelines, um, uh, so we have published the, all our production pipelines in this Git repository in case you want to start using them to be sure that your data, that the data that you analyze now can be aligned later with the data of the consortium. And these pipelines mainly follow pipelines that were already uh, out there, except for uh, a few modifications. And uh, for the ones that are not familiar with uh, the feature extraction pipelines, very roughly, we start from an image that is subjected to illumination correction. Uh, we segment single cells and we extract three compartments uh, for each cell, so the nucleus, cytoplasm, and the complete uh, cellular area. And then we extract uh, features for each of these compartments such as texture, shape, intensity, and many more. And uh, the modifications that we did uh, compared to the previous pipelines is that besides using these uh, three compartments here, we're now also included, uh, included features, uh, so features outside the cell, so an extra compartment. We also added special features for the mitochondrial channel, which describe uh, the skeleton or tubeness of the mitochondrial network. And we also follow the reasoning that we should include as many features as possible in this pipeline, and then better rely on feature selection later on uh, uh, for the downstream applications. And uh, for the deep learning feature extraction, we're also designing a protocol uh, to extract uh, uh, features using deep neural networks. And for this, we're using the deep, profi deep profiler framework, which takes images as an input together with cell locations and then uses different architectures to compute single cell embeddings or single cell features. And of course, the single cell uh, locations uh, need to be pre-computed with uh, a software of your choice. In this case, we're using cell profile. And in this case, we're comparing uh, again three types of models, uh, so three different models to extract the single cell features. And we're comparing these models based on their ability to discriminate between different modes of action. And uh, just as a, as a parenthesis, so all these single cell features are uh, undergo a post-processing uh, step, which includes aggregation, normalization, uh, spherization, and feature selection, where spherization is this uh, is a typical variance normalization transform that was published in 2017, and we have found that it's very useful uh, for this type of applications. Um, all right, so the models that we're using for the single cell features is the cell profiler pipeline that I explained before. We're also using pre-trained architectures uh, trained on ImageNet, but we're also retraining the classifier of these architectures uh, on a task that is more relevant for our data set. But um, uh, one important aspect that we need to uh, think about if, uh, when deciding on which task to retrain these classifiers is that even though we want to evaluate the features based on their, their ability to discriminate between different modes of action, at the end, we wouldn't like to use this mode of action labels to train the model, but we would rather use a less uh, biased and less supervised approach where we can make use of the full data set that we have available and not only the subset for which we have mode of action annotations. And uh, therefore, taking this into account, and then we decided to start with a weekly supervised representation learning approach in which we train the classifier to <clears throat> predict the treatment of single cells. So we're basically asking the classifier to predict with which compound each single cell was treated. And of course, this treatment uh, information uh, comes from the metadata of the experiment. It doesn't require any further labeling. And uh, here are the results. So we're comparing the different architectures using several metrics, such as the average precision at top K. But we also proposed a, a novel metric uh, to evaluate this type of features, uh, which we called enrichment fold. And uh, for this, what we do is that we select the smallest uh, one to five points percent of all pairwise, pairwise distances in the data set, and then check if these pairs that are close together, uh, uh, how often these uh, pairs that are close together contain the same mode of action compared to just random sampling uh, pairs uh, from the data set. And uh, so it tells us uh, what are the odds of having the same mode of action between profiles or perturbations that are close together in the embedding space compared to random sampling. And uh, from the, the, these are the very first results that we have in this direction. 
we, uh, we can see that based on, on the enrichment fold, the deep learning architectures already per outperform cell profiler. And if we look at the average precision, uh, at top K, cell profiler is still a bit better, but we can also see that the uh, trained architecture with this weekly supervised task uh, is already better than the pre-trained architecture. So this is already a very encouraging results and we're very confident that uh, putting uh, more effort and training uh, uh, these networks will we will uh, outperform cell profiler or at least uh, match. And finally, uh, uh, I also want to highlight uh, another um, project that we're having in collaboration with uh, Umea, Uni Umea University in Sweden. And here we're investigating what is the contribution of bright field image features to the profiles. And for this, this is again very um, a, a preliminary results where we compare uh, the full, pro, uh, full profiles with all the fluorescent channels from cell painting versus profiles obtained only with bright field images. And uh, here, if we project the profiles using a PCA, we find very striking correspondences between the two uh, types of profiles. And even if we select a region uh, such as this red or blue regions in the two profiles um, feature spaces, there is very good correspondence between, uh, between them. So the, this also encourages uh, to uh, us to study in this direction and maybe consider bright field imaging as a labeled free profiler alternative. All right, and I hope I didn't go over time and I want to thank again as the uh, 100 plus people who have contributed with uh, work in the consortium and also thank the organizers for uh, letting me show this work in, the, in this meeting and for organizing this meeting with so many interesting talks and yeah. I'll welcome questions later. Thank you.